Okay, thanks a lot, Neil, for this uh, introduction and for the invitation. Uh, it's really, it's really great that uh, the candidates can can present their work, as uh, most uh, most of the uh, listener will will see. Uh, we have done quite a lot of things before uh, engaging into a PhD. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's great to, to do that now. It's a real pleasure. So uh, very quickly, uh, I will show you a couple of things I've done in, in the past, both as a student, but also as an academic and uh, as a practitioner and entrepreneur. Uh, let me uh, start with my student here. When I was a student in Paris, I created a student review. I was already very much interested in everything associated with technology, but also with reality. I consider myself almost as some sort of a realist architect. And this image of uh, Ludwig Hilgersheimer, one great realist. I started to write quite early. I'm very much interested in architectural theory for, let's say, for a while, uh, very much from the beginning of my architectural studies, or maybe even before that. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm interested also in, let's say, publishing and, and sharing ideas and, and theoretical uh, concepts. So this is why I kept working in this student magazine uh, I found it and uh, I edited at that moment in, in 2000. I wrote already at that time on technology and I have to say that I really didn't change my, my mind in my interest, uh, in my deep interest in technology. Of course, my ideas did evolve quite a lot, but my interest in technology is still, is still present today. I, yeah, I'm, I just love it. I'm just fasc fascinated by this because at some point it's the main driver in the evolution of humankind. When we look at things on the long term, we see that probably the most important um, driving force in, in, in the evolution of civilization is technology. This is why I'm really interested in it. Uh, I like also to publish some other things. For example, uh, here we made available some essay by Peter Eisenman in French for the very first time. And uh, yeah, uh, very few, uh, I mean, quite right after that, let's say in 2005, I organized a workshop for my students in Paris. I started to teach two years ago, I was still a student. But in 2005 at the Villa Van Desbourg in Meudon in France, uh, I taught a, a class a uh, uh, one week, a uh, uh, two weeks workshop, sorry, entitled Introduction to Algorithmics with and, and Bezier Geometry with Mathematica. And I was, and I'm still interested in the use of, of soft, software, uh, not so much an interface, but really software as a machine which can produce codes. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm still working in that way at some point. So uh, at that moment, we also created in Paris, uh, Malakai, my, my school, um, with Professor Christian Girard. Uh, we created uh, a new program, which was dedicated to digital technology. France was really much behind uh, when, it came, when it comes to digital technology. And, and we managed to, uh, yeah, I mean, to develop something rather interesting. So in partnership with Gary Tech, um, which uh, Gary Technologies Europe was based in Paris at that moment. And, and I, had, I had a lot of friends and ex-students uh, working there, uh, being in charge of a very important project. We decided to launch uh, again with Christian Girard and with Pierre Kutelik, uh, an, an ex-student of mine who is now a PhD uh, finishing his PhD at ETH in Zurich. So we, we launched a, a master program called Digital Knowledge. This program became later a, a fully fledged department uh, in the school. And one of the main uh, drivers for this program was to pay attention to new forms of enterprise and new forms of in industrial production. And as you will see, it also, this also explained 
my um, yeah my my own evolution at at some point. Uh, so uh, in this program we develop three three uh, uh, let's say domains main domains we call uh, digital knowledge digital design and digital fabrication. Uh, we also organized some conferences, for example, this one in 2015 and 2016, uh, artificial intelligence, the end of intelligence and architecture as we know them, uh, and also another one about the converge convergence of AI, robotics, and automation. Uh, obviously, we organized many more, let's say, individual lectures uh, as well. We published also a couple of things. Uh, some of the work of our students were published uh, by Neil, by the way, in China. Uh, in, and also we published a, a, a book uh, entitled Computational Politics and Architecture from Digital Philosophy to the End of Work. In this book, we really try to address the issue of uh, not just the impact of digital techniques in architecture, but really something larger with with a, I mean addressing the big picture about how artificial intelligence and computer computation deep computation is reconfiguring let's say everything in the world including politics uh, personally I, I I kept publishing in many of these uh, uh, quite famous magazines uh, like ad and, and some others in 2008, uh, I published five of my essays. Uh, probably I have written something like 34, but I think those five are quite uh, uh, maybe the most important. So I published them in 2008 um, <coughs> at the, uh, with, the, with the support of Sydney University Press. Uh, and I kept uh, uh, writing in some different uh, let's say support. In, to, in 2006, I was also one of the organizers of the International Mathematica Symposium in France, in Avignon. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I keep working with Mathematica. So that I, I was very interested in creating cross relationship between, um, between architecture, uh, science, and, and uh, algorithmics. Uh, in 2007, I organized, I was a curator of an exhibition I organized in Marseille, uh, in the south of France, entitled Architecture Beyond Form, the computational term. Uh, I presented uh, my, some of my friends, obviously, Alison Drasek, uh, uh, Akim Menges. Uh, uh, at that moment, Akim was not alone. It was it was still uh, he was still um, sorry working with uh, uh, Michael Ansel. Um, so we presented also Hernan Diaz Alonso, um, FOA, and many uh, other uh, people. The so the idea behind this exhibition, I really started uh, let's say the the exhibition uh, in. 1963, the idea was to start from the masters, from the PhD thesis of Peter Eisenman, entitled The Formal Language of Modern uh, uh, Architecture. And uh, I, I, I wanted to build a discourse uh, dedicated to our abstraction and how the evolution of notation, but also a kind of proto-computational approach was created at that moment in 63, and how we came to our uh, current agenda um, in at, at, at that date, I mean, 2007. So uh, I presented also early work from Zahadid, from Bernard Chumi, Park de la Villette, et cetera. And as you can see here, also some uh, important uh, work by Peter Eisenman. So I was really interested, as the title said, uh, in architecture beyond the formal agenda. Not with, I mean, it's not that I'm not interested in shapes, of course, it's far from it, but I really wanted to go beyond that and to think about also automation. So for example, I was very, we, we also presented the work of uh, Kurt Immelblau, especially this work, uh, this preliminary, preliminary studies, 
for the Malibu house, but also an automatic uh, drawing that uh, Wolf Briggs made with Claude Parent. I was very much interested in this idea of automation, uh, even if we don't use computers, which was the case. And, and we uh, presented also for the first time the, this now very famous break wall by, by Fabio Gramadio and, and Matthias Keller uh, from ETH. So, uh, in fact, this was really in line with my interest uh, in automation, in notation, in the digital, uh, as a fundamentally um, different model of, of thinking. Um, it's discrete, of course, those information are, are discrete. And I was, let's say, a bit sick of what was happening at that time with Rhino and all the beautifully uh, curvy uh, shapes. I mean, it's not that I was sick, but I really wanted to discover something, something different uh, beyond that. And uh, I was also convinced by uh, the fact that shapes were not the main driver, but the data became the main driver. So this is why I, I worked on, on that. Um, I'm, I was and I'm still interested in AI, uh, hence my, my um, uh, PhD. I mean, uh, why, uh, as you well, I'm working really on that matter in a rather precise way. Uh, and I'm interested in that. This is a diagram uh, I came up with in, in 2002, um, which explained, according to me, the deep revolution we are experimenting, we are experiencing at the moment, because we are really uh, leaving rationalism behind us. Uh, let's say the architecture of Rem Collas, even Peter Eisenman at some point, and many other architects like that. And we are entering something I call computationalism. Uh, I borrowed this, this term from cognitive science, uh, but I, I, I'm giving it a, a slightly different uh, meaning. Oh, okay, it's not a it's not a lecture about theory, so I'm not gonna go in into detail uh, about that. But I, I, I still I, I really wanted to show that. So very quickly, I will show you a couple of projects. Uh, I'm not gonna explain in detail. Uh, it would take too long, but uh, just yeah, just consider the visual. I think it's it's uh, interesting. So I started in 2003 working for an exhibition architecture, uh, non-standard, uh, non-standard architecture at the Centre Pompidou. I was invited by Frederick Miguel to work uh, on a set design. Uh, the concept was given uh, by Frederick Miguel and the co-curator uh, Zaneb Menan, a Turkish uh, uh, woman, uh, both very interesting, of course. Uh, so we took it as a kind of, of algorithmic experiment. So I, I created all of this uh, ribbon, uh, just like absolutely everything. Uh, it was uh, all uh, CNC cut, uh, etc. computing the maximum curvature, even computing the deformation of the images. We pre-deformed the image so that they could uh, be not to deform when we were facing the, these images. So it was a very, very interesting work uh, for, for, for my office and, and myself. Uh, it was mostly about patterns. Um, also, by the way, I believe this very concept of pattern is in, important in any case. Uh, but it, it was also about computing because the, we, we had to find uh, uh, an highly interesting pattern, but with each of these area uh, being 45 square meter, because each architect wanted to have uh, the, same, the same area. So we mostly managed to, to get it. I mean, the final areas were between 43 and, and 46. Uh, here is the uh, uh, development of the ribbons. Um, to be CNC cut uh, with, uh, with the structure and all of, all of that. And here you can see the mathematical coding for the, the pattern on, on the floor. Uh, we exhibited this in, in uh, Japan afterwards. Um, in 2005, we made really big CNC models, etc., etc. And I kept uh, working on that uh, on a more scientific level by, uh, let's say, investigating the, 
the patterning issues associated with uh, the developability of surfaces. And I came up with, with uh, a concept of uh, iso Gaussian curvature, uh, which I uh, experimented and I, 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 I demonstrated that uh, it's, it's a naturally adaptive pattern and super optimal pattern when, when you want to, uh, to uh, build um, double curvature surface and when you want to approximate them with, with developable surfaces. Then I kept also working on perceptions and all the potential of, of algorithms. Um, then slightly later, I worked on uh, something uh, even more mat, let's say, mat oriented, uh, oriented towards mathematics. Uh, based on the work of George Steiny and, and Gibbs, I, I wanted to ask for myself, what does it mean to work on the concept of algorithmic aesthetics? Uh, it's clear that algorithmic aesthetic meant something beyond all of these traditional, uh, beyond what you can get with these tools. But uh, as a student, uh, already I was not very interested in that. Uh, I mean, it's amazing the power of these tools, uh, like Rhino and obviously with Grasshopper and, and the uh, countless plugin, it's much better. It's even more powerful than, than uh, Rhino alone, of course. But I, I wanted to know at some point what uh, each of these icon was doing. I wanted to go beyond the, beyond the interface. So I really started to make use of Mathematica in an intensive manner. Because when you open Mathematica, you just have a blank page. Uh, and at some point, uh, I also rediscovered the joy of being alone in front of a gigantic paper, a uh, sheet of paper, you know, A4, uh, sorry, A0 uh, paper, like when I was a student. For me, Mathematica was really, yeah, a white page. It's, it was a new. Uh, a new universe that I could investigate, and I, I, I really felt in love with, with, with this. So I wrote this uh, book called Empiricism and Objectivity, Architectural in Investigation with Mathematica. It was a book written in code, but it was also with a, with a few comments. Uh, and my, let's say my philosophical approach for that was I David Gensteinian. But it was so. It was really based on, on the significance, the signification of knowledge, but also uh, the concept of pattern. I end up saying that ultimately knowledge is uh, about identifying patterns, and it doesn't matter if it's done by a computer or by a human. When you know, it means that you can understand the pattern, and when you when you create knowledge, it means that you create new patterns. So it's a kind of endless loop, a kind of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, di uh, dialectic uh, between what you learn and what you create, but ultimately, ultimately it goes through, through the concept of pattern. Uh, this was presented in Coder Le Monde, uh, Coding the World at Saint Pompidou, uh, with some of my heroes, so I was really, really, uh, let's say, proud of, of, of that. Uh, in 2004, we work with my office on the concept of uh, optimization. Uh, everything started with an essay I wrote uh, entitled um, uh, on optimization, as simple as that. Uh, and I wanted to create some sort of proof of concept of the importance of the concept of optimization, both in architecture, but also in industry. And I also wanted to, to to go back to the kind of raw, raw matter, the raw um, material of data, you know, the yeah, raw data, pixels, uh, uh, etc., uh, that I, I I discovered within the work of in the work of pioneers like uh, Nicolas Negroponte. So uh, we created this uh, uh, a chair. Um, uh, again, uh, we started with a big block of matter. We gave a couple of constraints to the algorithm and we used grid computing because at that time it was very, very, um, let's say, ta uh, uh, sorry, uh, 
intense, you know, uh, regarding the computational resources needed for for yeah co computing the deformation and all of that. So we use twelve computers uh, in a cluster at the Ecole Polytechnique, and we came up with this uh, twenty five models of of chair. Uh, Mario Carpo later identified this uh, as a kind of starting point of uh, discrete discretism or discrete architecture. I don't know how we can call that, but in any case, uh, as something which is part of what Mario calls uh, the second digital turn compared to the first digital turn he identified in the alphabet and the algorithm. Uh, we worked on the zero C competition, as uh, Neil just mentioned, we kept the same princi principle. But at that time, we worked on the evolution of light, optimizing the light condition in a, in a pavilion. So we came up with this uh, proposal, which unfortunately is not built, but uh, yeah, it's like that. Um, at some point, I, I, I believe this project is quite interesting, but to be honest, uh, I, it's a project that I, I don't like it. I mean, I don't like so much. I, I, have a very, I have a very ambiguous relationship with this project, even if I know that if, if it would have been built, it, it could have been just amazing. But again, it's not. Uh, so this was the model presented at uh, the, the exhibition in Paris. Yeah, I also developed this. Uh, uh, I went back to my, my interest in discrete architecture, developing this uh, based on cubes. So different con configuration of, of cubes, creating different curvature of discrete planes basically, and also working on a self-interlocking construction component that could be scalable. Because the chair was, was nice, but uh, the technique we use for, for uh, the, let's say, the realization of this chair was not scalable. So I wanted to have something scalable, and I came up with this U-Cube. It's a, it's a universal construction component with universal panels that you can clad. Uh, and the question of shape at some point is, is completely uh, evacuated um, uh, because, yeah, we can just use the same component and we can do whatever we want. So it's a definitely a pure discrete, discrete uh, architecture. Uh, in 2009, uh, we, we, we bought a robot in my office. And we started experimenting with, with uh, wire cutting, etc. But mostly we, uh, we um, let's say, sponsor the development of a plugin for controlling the robots. Uh, it's an AL plugin uh, written by Thibaut Schwartz, who is here. Uh, he was a student of mine. He was a long-term intern at, at, at my office. And uh, this uh, was the starting point of our interest in, in robotics. I mean, it's not that I was not interested in robotics before, but uh, by, by interest, I mean having a proper robot, uh, making use of it and developing tools so that we can uh, more easily uh, uh, make use of these of this robots. <clears throat> like two years later, we were invited for um, an exhibition and we started uh, to work on a slightly different uh, concept, but as you will see, in fact, it's 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 really in the continuity of what I was interested. Uh, I was interested in developing um, discrete structures. Uh, obviously, this is discrete, as you can see. Something super light, but I didn't want to do it with steel. I did. I wanted to do it with uh, with concrete, with uh, UHPC, because I believe that the new possibilities offered by UHPC are absolutely uh, 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 immense uh, and unpromising. So I, I reconsidered the issue of, of a concrete lattice by making use of a completely discrete approach that I developed before. So I used uh, the idea of the U-shape uh, and the hot wire 
so that we can cut in, in pieces of foam, we can cut trajectories, uh, cavities, and by working on the relations between all these cavities, you can create uh, uh, lattices of any complexity. So this is why, in fact, there's a, there's a relationship between U cube and this uh, lattice con construction in concrete. In fact, the lattice construction is a kind of negative uh, result of the U cube, uh, that cube being uh, the positive. So we kept working on that. Um, let's say investigating more complexity when it comes to structure, investigating the possibility of run by genetic algorithms and selections, etc. And then because uh, uh, the U cube uh, principle was extremely difficult to to deal with, uh, we didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough resource at that moment. So I wanted to to keep investigating the issue of concrete. But uh, I changed my uh, approach and I, I used uh, the 3D printed uh, 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 mold made of sand. So we worked with a company in, in Germany. It was in 2012. And as you can see, we poured in, in this 3D printed mold, we poured some high performance uh, fiber reinforced high performance concrete. So you see this extremely lightweight and elegant. Uh, three-dimensional concrete structure, which is which is structural, by the way, um, and uh, it's uh, yeah, it's maybe the most probably, let's say, it's the first super light concrete structure. Just to give you a, a, an idea of the scale, the diameter of these uh, tubes, concrete tubes, are from two centimeter to three point five centimeters. It's super light, uh, and here you see the presentation also uh, later in, in, in the museum. So the company in Germany was Voxel Jet. Uh, they were really happy to work with us uh, on that. So it was their, their very first application uh, in the domain of, of architecture, uh, I mean, for this company. I kept investigating this with my students uh, in London at the Bartlett. As you can see here, with slightly different approaches. For example, here, it was about casting concrete in deformable uh, plastic molds so that we can play with the gravity and with the deformation uh, to have a mold which is, let's say, self-adaptive. Uh, the more weight at the bottom, the more the mold deforms itself. So the more material it can it can um, uh, get, uh, which ultimately gives you a, a structure with more, more material at the bottom and less and less material when you go up, which is a very natural way of of building. Uh, we worked also on the deformation of uh, on the prediction of the behavior of Canva. Uh, of uh, fabric form framework by making use of computer simulation. And again, so that we can create three-dimensional uh, concrete structure with uh, really tiny uh, members. More recently, I made some interesting graphic design work for an exhibition at San Pompidou, which was called Neurons. Um, so it's perfectly in line with this uh, PhD program, by the way. Um, uh, I was in charge of some graphic design, but it was not just graphic design, it was uh, at some point data visualization. So I wrote a couple of uh, algorithms and I to, to, uh, to sort all these images. Um, so uh, I made some data analysis uh, with a bit of statistics and all of that, so that all of these images could get their uh, almost natural place on, on, on a board, uh, on the wall. For that, I, uh, I, I used all the Wikipedia entries of all of the authors of all of these images, starting uh, from the 13th century. And I ran some data, data analysis so that I could find correlation between images, people, dates, etc., etc.
So you can see this here. Uh, these are the relational matrix for these images. And finally, uh, and I will end up uh, with this. Finally, I'm very, very much interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, I, I push my students to develop uh, companies. Uh, and I, I initiated in, uh, in 2015, a company called X3. Uh, this company was a direct result of uh, all the work we have done uh, before and with uh, my office Easy City from, yeah, let's say 2007, 2008, and for sure from 2009, where, when we bought an industrial robot. Um, and this company was dedicated to large scale uh, 3D printing. So here we see uh, it was still uh, 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 the installation of, of Easy City at that moment. We printed clay, uh, complex uh, mold made of clay, so that we can we could pour in some fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, and then it's very easy to remove the clay because you just need to wash it. Uh, and since the clay is not cooked, uh, it dissolves itself and you can reuse it uh, as many times uh, as you want. So this is a result of an optimization that was done in Mathematica also in my, in my office. Uh, and uh, it was the beginning of a really uh, very interesting adventure in entrepreneurship, uh, giving birth to uh, the company you will see. Uh, later, so these are still uh, are also. Um, this is a mold for spraying uh, fiber reinforced concrete. So the company I created was uh, X3. I'm the founding CEO of the company. We presented uh, in different places here in the back. You see a pavilion that was commissioned by Dassault System. It was a very very great experience for me. And here we see, you see uh, something which is, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, how, how should I call, uh, yeah, it's a lattice. Uh, we designed this in 2012, uh, exactly at the same moment that we designed the lattice you saw before and the super lightweight lattice. But the funny story is that we, design, we designed this in 2012 and at that time, we, we, we thought that we would build this with 3D printed sand mold but, and pouring some concrete in. But ultimately, uh, it was a public project in France, but everything is so bureaucratic and so slow that the project took an amazing amount of time to, to, to be built. So when it was ready to be built, uh, we made really good progresses and we already created the 3D printing company at that moment. So we didn't have to, to, to call for this German company. We could do everything by yourself. So we printed by yourself the cement, the high performance concrete uh, mold. And we also cast it in this high performance uh, mold. We, we cast it the, uh, the concrete. So it's a four meter high column. Uh, that was uh, the very first of its kind. Uh, making use of uh, ultra high performance uh, 3D printing concrete with uh, with also uh, fiber reinforced high performance concrete filling, and uh, and here is also another example of uh, the kind of construction component you can get by making use of 3D printing 3D printed concrete. So now I'm a shareholder of the company. The company. Uh, 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 lives its own life, and I'm investigating some other things, uh, mostly mostly related to uh, design, uh, because as an architect, I'm of course uh, deeply interested and deeply in love with with design. So yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot.